Namo Buddhaye. I hope you're all doing well. Tonight, day nine. So it's progressing quite along. We are almost at the end of this retreat. And tonight will be the last <laughs> the last of the more consistent talks I, I think that uh, we can call it like that and um, tonight will be a little bit of a revision and um, a slightly different angle uh, to the whole of the path and I thought we uh, could prepare ourselves slowly to uh, go back into <laughs> this world. Reading along this sutta, which is the second of the middle length sayings, it's all the distractions, sabha sawa sutta, and this particular sutta treats about all kinds of distractions and how how these things we call distractions or the mental things, the mental impurities or the mental, all of it <laughs> is happening. And um, it covers quite nicely um, all of the ways that we not only uh, when we sit and we, we experience these things, these distractions, well, there, it's not only when we sit, it's in fact all the time. <laughs> and there's all ways, um, there's all kinds of ways that we pick them up. And you might be thinking, well, why are you saying this at the end of the retreat? And why not in the first few days? <laughs> um, well, there's just so many first few days in the retreat, so we have to pick and choose. <laughs> and it also ends quite nicely because this is really an all-around kind of instruction, whereas this is integrated to life. We, this is all, in everything that we do, there's all kinds of ways that we, uh, we pick these up. And it's always good to know different angles on how, oh yeah, this, this makes sense. Maybe, maybe um, I can try this or uh, more practical advices. And of course, it goes more and more towards uh, mental development, the meditation. And then we will uh, have a little bit of a review of all the jhanas briefly in this wonderful sutta called Nibbana is happiness. Therefore, we will see, um, review a little bit of the whole of the path and specifically the most um, practical, <laughs> practical side of it. And once again, this is at Sawati, Anatta Pindika's monastery. And this was the main monastery where uh, the Buddha uh, taught for about 20 years. So that was a very, very um, well-known uh, place. That's why most of the suttas come from that place. It's because he was there a lot. And he addressed the monks, saying, Monks, Badante, the monks replied, Monks, I will teach you the complete mastery of all distractions. So this sounds pretty promising. Listen carefully and apply your mind to what I will say. Yes, Bhante, the monks replied. The awakened one said this. The calming of mental distractions is for one who is conscious and watchful 
not for one who is not conscious and not watchful. By being conscious and watchful of what does the end of distractions come to be? When there is wise awareness, wise attention, and when there is unwise attention, Being unwise with one's attention, new distractions come to be, and old distractions increase. Being wise with one's attention, new distractions do not come to be, and old distractions are given up. So, in brief, this simply means, what are we doing with our minds? <laughs> it's not only in meditation, but all the time. Monks, there are distractions that should be given up by discernment. There are distractions that should be given up by self-mastery. Some distractions that should be given up by reflection. Some others that should be given up by endurance. Some others should be given up by avoiding. Yet some others should be given up by release, and some others should be given up by development. So see, there's all kinds of ways of uh, dealing with distractions. How are distractions given up by discernment? And here is what the Buddha called having a straight view, straightening our view, and this is what this first part is about. Knowing things properly in the Dhamma. Here a person does not learn the Dhamma of the awakened people, does not visit the awakened people, nor does not know nor practices the Dhamma of the awakened people, does not visit the people of truth, does not know nor practices the Dhamma of the people of truth. See, there were so many kinds of spiritual practices at the time of the Buddha. Well, this might sound like uh, preaching for uh, uh, our own um, little circle, but um, some, some spiritual practices at the time of the Buddha was... Uh, Mm, for example, some were uh, behaving like dogs, and this was their uh, spiritual practice. Um, uh, walking around on all fours and uh, eating with uh, their face in a, a bowl and not touching uh, anything with uh, their hands or things like that. So there was all kinds of spiritual practices. And so here... Um, to, in fact, and this will be tomorrow's talk, uh, the topic, uh, the Buddha very often began um, speaking on these things, on the, on the path and on wise understanding, with this introduction about how important it is to, in fact, um, surround ourselves or to to go to people that um, practice, that are wise, that are uh, practicing uh, goodness and that um, are knowledgeable about it so that we can, in fact, progress. Otherwise, it's very hard. That person is not likely to understand what things are proper for attention and what things are improper for attention. Therefore, unknowingly, one attends to things improper for attention, and one does not attend to things proper for attention. How does one attend to the things improper for attention? One attends to the things which make new distractions of outward desire arise, and old distractions grow. That makes new distractions of becoming or um, egoism arise and old distractions of egoism grow. 
new distractions of carelessness to arise and old distractions of carelessness to grow. Now, in order, this could simply be... Of course, the first one you, you, you probably know by now. Anything that we might want out in this world. Not that this is particularly unwholesome, but the thing is that these three things are bottomless pits. So there's never, there's never an end to it. So the mind can always spill more and more. And this is why this word, this discourse is about the asawas, because I translate it as distractions, but in fact, asawa means something that is flowing, like flowing out. And these are the distractions. It is the mind flowing out towards these things. And um, all of these things that we can experience at the senses, this is a big, <laughs> a big leak. And um, all of these, all of these things that we might uh, want to project in the future or become and all things like that. Not that it's all of it is wrong or bad, but simply that um, there's no there's no real end to this. So we cannot calm the mind if we can constantly engage in these things. And of course carelessness like uh, drinking, intoxication and all these things there will be, um, it will be hard to cultivate a straight view. In this way, one attends to the things improper for attention. And how does one not attend to things proper for attention? One does not attend to the things which make new distractions of outward desires not to arise and old distractions to fade away. And that can be, well, basically all of this, but this could be uh, all seen as meditation or here um, generosity or letting go, relinquishing, contentment, these things. New distractions of egoism or becoming not to arise and old distractions to fade away. This would be loving kindness, compassion. New distractions of carelessness to arise and old distractions of carelessness to fade away. And this can also be seen as, this is awija, so uh, often translated as ignorance. But here we can simply take this as uh, wanting to learn how things work, how, how the Dhamma works. And... Uh, learning more and more about it so that we can in fact always get closer to understanding and true knowledge here. In this way one does not attend to the things proper for attention and one attends to things improper for attention. Not attending to the things proper for attention, new distractions arise and old distractions multiply. So this is simply what happens if we put our attention on these three things. It just keeps flowing out because it's endless. And uh, here is another fold of it. Then one unwisely attends in this way. Did I exist for a long time? Did I not exist for a long time? Why did I exist all this time? For what reason did I exist in the past? Having become what? How have I existed in the past? Will I exist in the future? Will I not exist in the future? How will I exist in the future? For what reason will I exist in the future? Having become what? How will I exist in the future? And one is perplexed regarding one's own present self. Am I? Am I not? Why am I? What am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? 
Now we could we could think that these are quite interesting questions, and that would be fairly right. Um, but the thing is, once again, it's simply the principle that these questions are unanswerable. We cannot answer them. There is no there is no answer to them. We cannot know these things, and that's what the Buddha taught: is that this samsara, what we've been doing here birth and death and rebirth and redeath and rebirth has been going on for time immemorial he said that the beginning of this samsara cannot be found and he tried to find it but he he never was able to therefore engaging the mind into these questions is it's not bad in itself it simply will bring up distractions. To one who attends unwisely, six views or some similar opinion take hold. The belief there is a self for me arises as undeniable truth. The belief there isn't a self for me arises as undeniable truth. The belief self is the witness of self arises as undeniable truth. The belief no self is witness of no self arises as undeniable truth. The belief no self is witness of self arises as undeniable truth. Or else the belief I am this self who speaks and feels, who is continuously experiencing the result of good and bad actions, and thus myself is permanent, steady, eternal, of unchanging nature, and it will stand continually in eternity. Monks, I say that this is running after dogma, thickening the dogma, a wilderness of dogma, the distortion of dogma, a flutter of dogma, the shackles of dogma. Bonded by the shackles of blind beliefs, monks, that person is not liberated from rebirth, aging, and death, difficulties, anxiety, and uneasiness. I say that this person is not liberated from trouble. Here a wise meditator visits the awakened people, learns and understands and practices the Dhamma of the awakened people visits people of truth, understands and practices the Dhamma from the people of truth. That person is likely to understand what things are proper for attention and what things are improper for attention. Therefore, knowingly one attends to the things proper for attention and does not attend to the things improper for attention. Now this is the same sequence, but uh, in a way that one attends, one does not attend to the things that make all of these distractions grow. And one attends to the things that makes these distractions go away. This is how one attends to the things proper for attention, thus not attending to things improper for attention, and attending to the things proper for attention. N new distractions do not come to be, and old distractions fade away. One wisely attends to things knowing this is tension. One wisely attends to, to things knowing this is the increase of tension. One wisely attends to things knowing this is the release from tension. One wisely attends to things knowing this is the way to release the tension. These are the Four Noble Truths, obviously. Attending in such a wise way, three fetters fade away. Belief in a personal self doubt in the Dhamma, and adherence to blind practices and observances. 
This is how distractions are given up by discernment. How <clears throat> and how are distractions given up by self-mastery? Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. Now this simply means being aware at any of the sense doors and being mindful, being like a doorkeeper to make sure that everything that's happening at all the sense doors, all the time, we are not in fact grasping or pushing away things which would bring up perhaps anger, resentment, or strong desires, or and then when these come up, then there are expectations. When there are expectations, they get broken, and then we get upset. So this is how it starts. Everything starts rooted from these six sense, uh, senses. Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the hearing faculty, guarded by the mastery of the smelling faculty, guarded by the mastery of the tasting faculty, guarded by the mastery of the touching faculty, guarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty. So even the thinking faculty, even the mind, indulging constantly in all these thoughts, there is no rest. There is no rest for the mind. And this is simply another sense which we need to let go, relax, take a step back. So this is quite a wonderful advice for us in everyday life. This is, in another way, this is how um, the Buddha explained wise awareness. To be simply aware of things as they happen at each of the sense doors and simply letting go all the time, not holding on to anything because it's all passing away. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. How could they be we're not holding on to any of this? In this way, when one practices unguarded by self-mastery, tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one practices guarded by self-mastery, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by self-mastery. How are distractions given up by reflection? And this is uh, what we call the four requisites, um, the parikaras. And these, in many monasteries, uh, the monks uh, will repeat them or chant them every morning to remember the four requisites and how to use them. And uh, this is um, food, shelter, clothing, and medicine, basically. These four very, very basic elements that the Buddha said, these four things are required for us to practice comfortably and to make progress and to live the, live the meditation and uh, this life of meditation and goodness at ease. But this is how also to see them and uh, use them and understand how to use them. 
How are distractions given up by reflection? While wearing robes, one reflects wisely. This is only to protect this body from the cold, to protect it from the heat, to protect from flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, insects, and lurking animals. This is only for covering the private parts. Now this is any kind of clothing, really. While eating alms food, one reflects wisely. This is not for playing around, not for intoxication, not for looking pretty, not for personal pride. This is only for sustaining and maintaining the body, for allaying discomfort and for the love of the spiritual life. In this way, I will appease any overwhelming feelings of hunger and will not create any new feelings of over overeating. In this way, I will become blameless and live at ease. While living in some residence, one reflects wisely. This is only to shelter from the cold, to shelter from the heat, to protect from flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, insects, and lurking animals. This is only to ease the disturbances of the seasons and for the purpose of meditation. While using medicine for illnesses and medical assistance or treatments, one reflects wisely. This is only to relieve any arisen hurtful, oppressive feelings in the service of the highest kindness of heart. See, so we only use these knowing that we they are basic needs, but we do not uh, go beyond this or not <laughs> as much as possible of course and everybody will be different and everybody will integrate that into their own lives as however they they wish to but this is the principle and now of course the more we the more we go overboard with any of those well then there's bound to be distractions. There is bound to be more uh, mental activity bent on these things, whereas when we only use them to support our practice, there's nothing to think about about these things. We only eat to eat, to stay alive, and to practice, and then using the robes to just not being cold or uh, protect the body and shelter for practice. And we stay very um, humble and uh, closer to a simpler way of life, which is allowing ground for uh, very good progress in the practice and s steady, um, steady, supportive environment for our practice. In this way, when one is unreflective, tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one is reflective, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by reflection. How are distractions given up by endurance? Reflecting wisely, one patiently bears with heat and cold, hunger and thirst, flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, insects, and lurking animals, ways of speech that are hurtful and unwelcome, and experienced bodily feelings that are painful, sharp, burning, severe, disagreeable, repulsive, and life-threatening. One is forbearing in nature. So this doesn't mean that we, in fact, go l out looking for these things. <laughs> but when they do come, when they do arrive, we simply just learn how to accept how things are at the moment and to let it go and to not take it personal and to not blow it out of proportion and to add up to the already um, 
perhaps disagreeable experience by adding mental um, agitation to the recipe. In this way, when one is not forbearing, tension and overwhelming distractions would come to be. But when one is forbearing, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by endurance. How are distractions given up by avoiding? Reflecting wisely, just as someone would avoid a mad elephant, a mad horse, a mad bull, a mad dog, a mad a snake, a stump, a thorny bush, a hole, a steep cliff, a cesspool, a sewage spill. Similarly, one avoids an unsuitable location associating with people bent on harm. And any action wise brothers and sisters in the spiritual life would recognize as harmful behavior. Therefore, reflecting wisely, one avoids unsuitable locations and people bent on harm. Now, there are these really coarse situations that we just simply want to avoid, like not going and standing in a really busy highway for no reason. That will bring up a lot of distractions in the mind or any kind of really dangerous uh, incredible situation that we could avoid just by not going there, not doing it. <laughs> so therefore, there's just this really basic common sense also of not going places that are really um, dangerous. Or threatening. In this way, when one does not avoid, tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one avoids, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by avoiding. How are distractions given up by release? Reflecting wisely, when a thought of outward distractions come, comes up, one does not continue along with it. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go, and undoes it, and brings it to an end. When the thought of anger comes up, one does not continue along with it. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go, undoes it, and brings it to an end. When a thought of harm comes up, one does not continue along with it. When a and one after the other, when harmful and unwholesome mental states come up, one does not continue along with them. One abandons them, releases them, lets them go, undoes them, and brings them to an end. In this way, when one does not release, tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one releases, Tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by release. And now the last fold of this uh, discourse on the distractions before we get into the, the jhanas in specific. How are distractions given up by development? So here we have the two, the two sections of right effort or wise practice to release, to let go, but this is not enough. And you might wonder, where is the joy in this? Well, this is where it comes in. And this is about the seven supports of awakening and bringing up wholesome states. Letting go is one part and bringing up wholesome states is the other part. How are distractions given up by development? Reflecting wisely, one develops the support of awakening of awareness, which is caused by letting go, not holding, releasing, and culminating in relaxing. One develops the support of awakening of discernment, 
which is caused by letting go, not holding, releasing, and that culminates in relaxing. One develops the support of awakening, of inspiration, of joy, of calm, of collected mental harmony, collectedness. And one develops the support of awakening of steadiness of mind, which is caused by letting go, not holding, releasing, and culminates in relaxing. In this way, when one does not develop the mind, tension and overwhelming distractions are bound to come. But when one develops the mind, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by development. Monks, when one has given up distractions to be given up by discernment, when one has given up those by self-mastery, by reflection, by endurance, by avoiding, by release and by development, one is called a monk who lives protected by the mastery of all distractions, who has cut away tension, flung off the shackles, perfectly gone beyond arrogance, who has made an end of trouble. And as we do this practice, we have seen in this in this sutta pretty much the entire eightfold path simply explained in a different way the only part missing is a bit on the jhanas and the levels of meditation and there are ways that this sutta can be also interpreted as this um, giving up the distractions is also what Nibbana is. Every time a distraction arises in the mind and that we let it go, at that time we are experiencing here and now a small kind of Nibbana, which Nibbana simply means to extinguish, to put out uh, all the, the fire of mental agitation. And so here, if we continue on, on this line of reasoning, we can um, understand how each of the levels of meditation is practicing release and practicing Nibbana. And each level is a more subtle and more elevated kind of happiness. Therefore, this is why the sutta is called Nibbana is happiness. And this is how we will end this whole summary of the path. And this is with the Venerable Sariputta who exclaimed to the monks, Nibbana is blissful, friends. Nibbana is blissful. When this was said, the Venerable Udayi said, What is the reason why, friend Sariputta, it is said to be blissful when there is nothing to be felt there? So now he's re referring to probably the, the last, the last uh, state uh, that occurs at the very end of the the whole path of the jhanas. And how is that, how can we consider this when there is nothing to be felt as happiness? Which is a very good question. And Sariputta replies, Bhante, that is exactly why it is blissful, friend, because there is nothing to be felt. There are these five kinds of sensory gratifications, friend. Forms perceived by the eye, sounds perceived by the ear, odors perceived by the nose, flavors perceived by the tongue, tangibles perceived by the body, which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. 
friend, the happiness and enjoyment that arises because of these five ways of indulging in the senses. This is called the happiness of sensory gratification. But here, friends, disengaging from sensory gratification and letting go of unwholesome states, still attended with thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental detachment, of letting go, one understands and abides in the first level of meditation. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with sensory gratification, and one feels it as a disturbance, just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy. There would be, this would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with sensory gratification, one feels it as a disturbance. So at this point, it feels better. The first level of meditation feels better because we, this kind of coarser awareness comes with quite a bit of tension. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without thinking nor reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. One understands and abides in the second level of meditation. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with thinking, and one feels it as a disturbance, just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with thinking, one feels it as a disturbance. Friends, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, with the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within one's body, that state which the righteous ones describe as steady presence of mind, that is a pleasant abiding, one understands and abides in the third level of meditation. When one abides meditating in such a way, one's awareness becomes invaded by a stronger joy. And one feels it as a disturbance. And this also is a wonderful sutta that shows us how, in fact, these jhanas, they are specific stations, but they are not, they do not happen all at once. We come in and out, and then this experience become more stable, more steady, and then this station is seen more clearly. It is experienced more clearly. But it is possible that sometimes the mind becomes a little coarser and some some qualities of the previous level of meditation are experienced again. And then we let go and continue cultivating and this, uh, this is how we always uh, also make progress, is that these previous qualities are coarser. Therefore, the more we develop our discernment, we will see that we simply are, the mind isn't really interested in, in these previous states that are coarser and it is moving towards more and more liberation which is 
more blissful, more um, a, a better kind of happiness for the mind. Just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness becomes invaded with stronger joy, one feels it as a disturbance. At that moment, joy just calms down. It's not so strong anymore. Disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the Blessed One. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, going beyond unattached to pleasant sensations and unstirred by unpleasant ones with the settling of mental excitement and heaviness with neither pain nor pleasure purified by unmoving presence. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. One abides meditating in this way, one's awareness becomes invaded with this bodily calm, which was the factor of the previous one. And one feels it as a disturbance. Just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness is invaded with this bodily calm, one feels it as a disturbance, this bodily uh, happiness. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the Blessed One. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood, Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, having entirely gone beyond all perception of form, with the awareness of the senses falling away, turning away from the awareness of plurality, aware of endless spaciousness, one understands and abides in the plane of endless spaciousness. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded by the perception of form. So here the body becomes, awareness of body becomes too coarse, too heavy for the mind. It loses interest in it. It wants to be more free. It wants to let all this go. So slowly the body becomes more, goes in the background. We're not slowly not so much aware of it. Just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness becomes invaded with the perception of form, one feels it as a disturbance. Disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the Awakened One. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless spaciousness, aware of endless consciousness, when one abides Meditating in this way, one's awareness becomes invaded by this awareness of endless spaciousness, and one feels it as a disturbance. So now we're getting pretty subtle. <laughs> but this sense of, this bigger sense of spaciousness, when the mind is starting to let it go and becoming more aware of every little mind moment, or everything that arises in the mind continually, that, se that sense of spaciousness is bulky. It feels bulky. It's fairly subtle, but at that point, the mind feels better and it delights in more liberation, more letting go, more freedom. 
Therefore, it's not so much interested in spaciousness anymore. It simply is more interested in resting in endless consciousness. Just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness becomes invaded with endless spaciousness, at this point one feels it as a disturbance. Disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. So more and more we're learning to delight in this Nibbana, to, to delight in letting go more and more. Further, friend, having entirely gone beyond the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with the awareness of endless consciousness, and one feels it as a disturbance. So, when we go beyond, when a person goes beyond this always arising consciousness at every mind moment, every little thing that arises, and very quickly the mind wants to, um, it feels like letting go of this, well, very quickly, or not at everyone's own pace, but the letting it go feels better, and when the mind gets to this space of there's not not much and simply uh, aware of being aware really without any kind of course or consciousness arising about one particular thing or another simply uh, f freer this feels much better just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be known that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, having entirely gone beyond the plane of bare awareness, one understands and abides in the plane between awareness and its limit. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with bare awareness, and one feels it as a disturbance. So here it's getting fairly subtle. <laughs> and the reason why it feels more coarse is that at this point, the mind is even letting go of awareness itself. And this feels better, this feels relieving, this feels liberating, freedom. And when this awareness of awareness or simply bare awareness or awareness of nothing only this awareness comes with tension it comes with and this is how we know this is how a person can stay longer and longer into this plane of awareness and its limit so we're s slowly the mind is letting go of awareness itself and when awareness comes it feels coarser it feels heavier and the mind the light it rejoices and this is a bit of a strong term but it <laughs> it finds more delight in letting even that go Just as if pain were to arise for one who is happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with bare awareness, and this is the clearest awareness that 
one can have or experience. One feels it as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the Blessed One. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, going entirely beyond the plane between awareness and its limit, one understands and abides in the release from perceptual awareness. And having seen with discernment, mental distractions are completely brought to an end. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And so we're going back to the beginning where Sariputta says, uh, where Udayi asks Sariputta, why is it happiness when there's nothing to be felt there? And so he's explaining this entire sequence just to get there and to explain that this whole time when we let go of the distractions and the coarser uh, qualities of awareness, this is more blissful and in this way Nibbana is happiness. And all the way up till the end where the mind is completely purified from them. And Nothing can be felt, but in fact, this is true liberation. This is complete freedom of mind. And this is the Nibbana, the happiness that was talked about at the beginning. And there is no direct correlation with the plane between awareness and its limit in this last stage because it is, um, it is a bit of a an in-between state where um, these two last stages are very very close to each other so it's only uh, there is no real particular um, qualities to the plane between awareness and its limit it simply is uh, a, a bit of a a bit of a little path to um, to the complete release of mind. Therefore, there's no real uh, strong qualities in there. And one, one's mind as it slowly learns to stay longer and longer and to let go at this point release and let go are quite automatic it's been uh, built in <laughs> enough that uh, the mind is almost on autopilot simply tiny tiny little adjustments here and there and letting go letting go letting go letting go of any kind of concept any kind of any kind of anything that could arise and the mind simply with some time longer sits as I've been already mentioning to all of you of course all in due time all working properly all taking care of yourselves making sure that there's no there's no f real physical pain in your meditation that would really um, alter your body or something simply making sure the body is doing good but the, these later stages are experienced with longer sits deeper release there's no real magic in uh, experiencing these they simply the mind simply needs some time and we simply need to allow this time and so on this entire sequence now you you must be wondering, when is he going to stop talking, this monk? <laughs> it's just going on and on. So this is it. <laughs> this, is, this is the end. I, I, I stop. I am stopping here. I uh, release, I'm releasing you from this per perpetual, <laughs> perpetual awareness of the monk talking. 
<laughs> mm. And so I hope you enjoyed this uh, little summary here. And this this is um, the the last of you know the the big talks for this retreat. Tomorrow will be a lighter lighter talk, and uh, it's day ten, so we we won't be going any much further deep in. And so we had quite quite a lot of material on this retreat. I understand, and but this is the purpose. So we have this condensed 10 days of just pure dhamma and then <laughs> we can uh, let some time happen and process and in day-to-day -day life and see what happens uh, most of you have uh, my contact information <laughs> if you have questions or anything you know where i live so <laughs> most of you know where i live so good just ring ring the gong and uh, <laughs> i'll know you're here anyhow is there do you have any questions you, you might want me to just stop right now <laughs> thank you Bonte, for this talk this evening good stuff um, I have a question regarding nirvana, and if there's if there's no awareness in nirvana, what is the difference between nirvana and just non-existence? <laughs> yes, yes. So that that's a very good question. There's some uh, suttas that answer that question, in fact, but. Um, well, there's a few uh, there's a few different um, aspects to consider. For example, well, what happens with the body? For example, there's uh, the way it is answered is that the body um, the, in in a dead person there's um, the body the body heat has dissipated. There's no more vital activity. Uh, there's no heat. There's no uh, the mental activity is seized. And one's faculties, one's, all of the faculties, they're broken. They're not working anymore. They can't, they don't function. And that's it. It's just a dead person. But the person who has um, entered Niroda or cessation, or the release from perceptual awareness, the body vitality is still there. There is still heat there's still breathing, there's still the, the ayu sankara, as we call them, the vitality formations. So all these things that are happening um, through, uh, simply because of the body, like the, the blood is moving around and doing its thing, there's heat. Um, there is no... Um, there is no perception nor uh, sensation and consciousness in that uh, person who is experiencing that, but their faculties are extremely pure and sharp and bright. So that is the... They're not experiencing <laughs> the, the things, but there is absolutely no to say there's no resistance there's absolutely no resistance in the mind and this cannot be attained through this can only be attained through this path of development there's no other way that this this kind of attainment can can be reached it can only be reached by completely purifying the mind to the very root until there's absolutely nothing in it anymore and, and then one's faculties are very very bright and clear and when one comes back there's very very crisp awareness in fact s s some people uh, many people most people who experience this state coming out for example they they will say it's like seeing HD <laughs> or very HD, very crisp, very noticing 
you know, some things that you wouldn't notice usually, very, very small little things you one can see, very definite, like an insect, you'll see like all these little, like, little features on it or some things like that. This is simply just to give an idea of how uh, this is another reason why it's uh, it's called hindrances. <laughs> it's because they hinder us, they hinder our faculties of awareness, of seeing, of even the senses. So when we're not really conscious of it, because right now our minds are very active, for example, even though we're not doing much, but... <laughs> Mind is, you know, listening and paying attention and engaging. So, but even this, there's a lot of action going on. But in a, in a person who's completely let go of all of that, their mind is so pure. And the first thing that happens when they come out is very crisp experience at all the senses. It can manifest in many ways. But mainly that's a, a big difference uh, in between these two. And um, it's, it is only something that can be attained through wisdom and discernment and mental development. Uh, you can't like knock somebody on the head and make, make it happen. It's not, it doesn't work like that. And so... Um, Yes, and I mentioned breathing. Well, now there's there's some uh, controversies on this uh, breathing or not breathing in in that state. I I will just take it back. But <laughs> I um, it's <laughs> it's it's fairly hard to to know these things because first of all, there's not a whole lot of people that are experiencing this this kind of state. And, uh, well, they're just not really aware, so it's hard to know if, <laughs> if they're breathing or not. So <laughs> it's this very fine line. So this is some major characteristics. Good, so let us share our merits and then we can go our way. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya sukha patta chani sukha hondu sabbe pipani no irang no punyang sabbe satta numodandu Sabba Sambhati Siddhiya Aga Sattaja Bhumatta Devanaga Mahidika Punyang Thang Anumaritva Chirang Rakhanta Buddha Sasasanang May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha sasana sadhu sadhu.